In this video, I'm going to talk about 10 cringy dating tips that Christians really need to stop offering. But before we start, just know that this is meant to be a lighthearted video. And some of these points we're going to be talking about aren't really that bad. Really, they get cringy, not because it's always untrue, but because of the way we apply these tips, when we apply these tips, and who we apply them to. So stay tuned, I'll explain that as we go along. And spoiler alert, tip number 10 is something that I have said before. So if you wanna be a part of roasting me in the comments section, make sure you watch to the end of this video. Cringy dating tip number one, attraction shouldn't matter at all if you're a Christian. Now, I understand why Christians often say things like this. We're trying to counteract the worldly sinful advice that all that really matters is attraction. And so it comes from a good place oftentimes, but it's obviously completely detached from reality. And it's an unbiblical thing to say that you should be in a romantic relationship with someone that you have zero physical attraction to. And one biblical place I can go to to prove that point is 1 Corinthians 7 verses 1 through 5. And there, a husband and wife are actually commanded to have sex together. And as we know, biologically, sex cannot occur if there's not some level of physical attraction. Number two, the man should lead and the woman should follow in a relationship. Now you might be saying, well, Mark, you've talked about that before. Isn't that true? Shouldn't husbands lead their wives and wives submit and follow to their follow their husbands as it talks about in places like Ephesians 5 and 1 Peter 3. Well, the reason this is cringy advice to give to dating couples is that those passages are clearly talking about husbands and wives. And it's a misapplication of those biblical truths to directly apply husband and wife's roles onto boyfriend and girlfriend. So it is not true that a boyfriend should lead his girlfriend. Really, before they're married, a woman should be leading herself and a man should be leading himself and they're not a married couple. Dating isn't pretend marriage, you know, where you just get to pretend you're married and then you don't feel like it anymore, you just get to bail. Dating should be used to gauge whether or not this couple wants to get married. So yes, you should see qualities of leadership in your boyfriend and you should see qualities of a woman who would be able to follow as a wife, but you don't actually want to fulfill those roles in dating. Number three, don't date. It's not in the Bible only court. It's true, dating is not in the Bible. However, what's ironic about this advice is neither is courting. I'm not saying courting is bad, I'm not saying dating is better, but courting and dating aren't in the Bible. And so we need to apply biblical principles to whatever method we end up using when it comes to pursuing marriage. These are just models, they're just a skeleton that you attach biblical principles to and that's how you can either date or court in a biblical or unbiblical way. Number four, make sure you ask her father for permission to date her and if you're a woman, make sure he asks your father for permission to date you. This idea comes from the courting model and again, I'm not bashing the courting model. I'm not saying it's always wrong for everyone. It definitely has some red flags in it that will mislead you, particularly the older you get. It's definitely a system that works better for younger Christians who have parents who are deeply involved in their lives right now. And so I'm not saying it's wrong to ask her father, you know, for permission quote unquote, to date her, As per particularly if that's what the woman wants you to do. If she comes from that type of background and she wants you to ask her father, then that's great. However, this advice gets really cringy when it's misapplied and maybe to say it better, it's applied in all situations. So what if the woman doesn't have a Christian father? What if the woman is grown been an adult out on her home out on her own for many years this idea of asking permission of her father really doesn't apply now listen i get it i understand that this is coming from a place of respect in most cases it is right to honor your father and mother and so i'm not trying to bash this completely 
but more so encouraging adults to find a better way to honor your father and mother rather than over applying that principle of honor and then thinking that means obeying. Because when you're a child, you are called to obey your parents. When you're an adult, you are called to honor your father and mother. So you really don't need your father's permission to date once you're an adult. Number five, God helps those who help themselves. We say this phrase because there are many biblical examples where we need to do something. So in that sense, it's it's true that we need to participate in God's plan to receive what he wants to give us. So that part of that advice is good. But contrary to popular opinion, this is not a Bible verse. God helps those who help themselves. That's not actually in the Bible. And I think the way it's said often misleads us to give us more credit for the outcomes because ultimately it's basically saying you might be single because God's not helping you, thus you must not be helping yourself. It, it creates this idea that those who are married have done a great job in helping themselves, therefore God has blessed them with a spouse and everyone else is not helping themselves enough. So it's, it's just an oversimplistic phrase that doesn't quite capture what scripture talks about. God is ultimately the one who is the who is responsible for the final results and we do play a role, but this phrase just doesn't quite help us. Number 6, the woman is always right or happy wife, happy life. This advice is usually given to young married couples or, you know, uh, engaged couples who are about to be married, but there's elements of it given in the pre-marriage phases and the dating phases as well. And it's a really bad advice for a couple of reasons, because first it makes it seem like the woman is more important than the man, which is obviously not true. You know, men and women are both important and if they're both not being valued in the relationship, eventually that's gonna get toxic and unhealthy down the line. Additionally, when a man actually has that mindset where he's just this little servant trying to make the woman happy, that actually decreases the likelihood of him being attractive to a godly woman because she's not looking for a little servant to do everything for her. She's looking for a man who can actually lead and that she actually wants to respect. And this mindset of being her little minion doesn't accomplish that. So the man's either gonna attract a diva who really needs all his attention and that's just gonna be a nightmare or he's gonna lose respect and a godly woman just isn't going to be attracted to him. So the man shouldn't be a pushy guy but he also shouldn't be a pushover. Number seven, never give anyone a chance if you're not instantly attracted to them. Now in point one, we discussed the other extreme to this reaction to attraction that Christians often have. Now we need to talk about the other extreme, the, the other side of this coin, which is that attraction really is one of the most important things and it can never change and don't give someone a chance if you're not attracted to them. It's not true because attraction does connect to our hearts and the way we see someone is directly attached to how we feel about them. And so when you get to know someone and you feel differently about them on the inside, that does sometimes affect the way that you see them in an attraction. Now, to be clear here, I'm not saying you should date or marry someone that you're not attracted to. I am saying you should be open to the idea of this changing. Give it a crack if you really respect this person's character and you really like them. Don't force it. I'm not saying you should force it. You just want to be open to the idea of it changing because sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But the absoluteness of this, never go with someone that you're not attracted to, that's extreme. Number eight, just do what I did. This one's usually expressed from married people who are giving advice to single people and it comes off extremely prideful and arrogant because it assumes that just because someone's married they instantly become a relationship expert and thus everyone who's single is clearly not a relationship expert. The truth is God's plans are not that simple. You know, sometimes someone can be extremely mature 
and not get married until later in life. And sometimes someone can be rather immature and get married earlier in life. And there are many possible reasons for that type of outcome. So the truth is God has a good plan for all of us. And the key is to follow God's plan and to live a biblically wise lifestyle. I like the way Oswald Chambers talks about trying to force other people to, you know, experience what we experience. He said, never make a principle out of your experience. Allow God to be as creative with others as he is with you. Number nine, this idea that all pastors are great matchmakers. So this one isn't necessarily like a dating tip or a phrase, but it's more so this belief that when the pastor suggests a single man and a single woman should be together, that this somehow has more weight and authority and perhaps it really is God putting these two together. So really, when you look at the qualifications of a pastor, for example, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, the qualification of matchmaker is not on the list. I know, that's surprising. So, Sure, give it a thought, maybe give it a little more weight because you respect your pastor and you know he's wise and you're going to that church for a reason. You know, that's part of it. You have a good pastor. So be respectful, think about it, pray about it, but you are under no obligation to follow your pastor's suggestion on who you date and it is not disobeying God to reject your pastor's opinion about personal choices that you're free to make. And number 10, when you meet the one, you'll just know. So this is the one I have said before. And here's my explanation for why I've actually used this advice. It's, I really actually would say this advice again in certain situations. The situation I would say this at is when you have already gone through a long season of dating. You've already gone through a wise process of trying to figure out if you two should get married meaning you have actually gone into a relationship with this person and you've gone through biblical steps. I do believe that eventually there is a almost supernatural peace that comes on the person that from God and gives you a confidence that, yeah, God is saying, go for it. And in that sense, you'll just know. Because, yeah, there are so many check boxes you can go through, but ultimately you're still going to wonder, is God really saying I should do this? And when you're single and you're not in that relationship, you're just going to wonder, how am I really going to know? And all I can say is, when you've gone through that process, God's going to just let you know. He's going to help you figure that out. Now, this advice gets really cringy and really bad when we over-apply it to, a, to people who aren't dating. If you've just like seen someone across the room, you're not going to just know. You know, you're not going to just know by dating someone for a week or, you know, just having a dream about them. I just know this is my future spouse. That's I've never said that. And I don't think that you should apply this idea, this tip to that type of situation where you haven't gone through a wise steps to figure it out. Here's a related video called 10 Dating Tips That Satan Often Uses to Keep You Away From Your Godly Spouse. I'm Mark from ApplyGodsWord.com. If this was a good video and you liked it, give it a thumbs up. That helps it spread to more people. Until next time, God bless.